Hello students, welcome back. Now in this section, we will be discussing the superficial fungal infections and the viral infections. First coming to the superficial fungal infections. Pityriasis versicolor or tinea versicolor. Now it is caused by a lipophilic fungus called as Malassezia furfur, also called as Pterosporum ovale or Pterosporum orbiculare. Now this organism is part of the normal flora. It is generally present in the hair follicles in the seboric areas of the body. The patient presents with hyper or hypopigmented perifollicular macules which coalesce to form patches which are covered with fine scales. That's why the word pityriasis versicolor. The word pityriasis means brand like fine scales and versicolor means different shades of presentation. So it could be hyperpigmented or hypopigmented. Now the scales sometimes are not prominent. So we can accentuate the scales by scraping. This is called as the scratch test or the Besnier sign or the coup de angle sign. Now on wood slab examination, the scales they show a golden yellow fluorescence. Now this is very classical for tinea versicolor. Coming to the investigations, uh, we generally do a KOH mount of the scales to see the fungal spores and hyphae, what is called as the spaghetti and the meatball appearance on KOH mount. Treatment, topical therapy includes uh, clotrimazole, myconazole, ketoconazole, or the newer agents that is oxyconazole, sertaconazole or selenium sulfide. And in cases of extensive tinea versicolor or patients who have recurrence, they can be put on oral fluconazole, ketoconazole and itraconazole. Now in tinea versicolor, one must remember that chrysofalvin is not effective against malassezia furfur and therefore it will not be effective. Therefore, chrysofalvin is not indicated in the treatment of tinea versicolor. Coming to the next superficial fungal infection that is candidiasis. It is caused by an opportunist yeast called as candida albicans and rarely it can be caused by other candida species as well. Now what are the predisposing factors for candidiasis? The first one is the extreme of age. Both infants as well as elderly people have a low immunity. Therefore, they are more prone to develop candidiasis. Hot and humid climate. Most of the fungal infections flare up because of hot and humid climate. Hyperhidrosis, that is patients who sweat more. Immunosuppression. Now, this immunosuppression could be because of HIV. It could be because the patient has some underlying malignancy or if the patient is on some immunosuppressants like chemotherapy. Diabetes mellitus is known to uh, precipitate candidiasis. Again, broad spectrum antibiotics because broad spectrum antibiotics will suppress the normal flora and promote the growth of candida. Pregnancy and OC pills can generally cause a flare up of vaginal candidiasis. Now coming to the variants of candidiasis, first is candidial intertrigo. The word intertrigo means the intertriginous areas or the body folds. So candidiasis of the body folds including the interdigital web spaces is called as candidial intertrigo. The patient presents with itchy, red, macerated erosions with satellite pustules at the periphery. The presence of satellite pustules at the periphery is very classical for candidiasis. In the web spaces, the patients will present with moist, macerated and whitish colored plaques. Now, the closest differential diagnosis for candidial intertrigo is tinea cruris. As I mentioned earlier, satellite pustules are highly characteristic of candidiasis. These are generally not seen in tinea cruris. What we see in tinea cruris is an active border, ring-shaped lesion and relative clear, clearing in the center. Coming to oral candidiasis, here the patients present with curdy white pseudomembrane present on the tongue, it could be present on the buccal, labial, gingival and palatal mucosa. Now this membrane can be easily removed and on removal of the membrane what we see is an eroded red base. Coming to vaginal candidiasis, the ladies usually present with thick curdy white vaginal discharge. They also have severe itching, redness and vulvar fissuring. Now if there is severe vaginal discharge, it can also lead to uh, candidial intertrigo in the surrounding areas. 
The closest differential for vaginal candidiasis is trichomoniasis. How do we differentiate this? In trichomoniasis, the discharge is thin and mucoid, whereas in vaginal candidiasis, the discharge is thick and curdy white. Coming to candidial balanitis, here the patient has pruritus, erythema and curdy white discharge over the glands and the prepuce with fissuring at the margins of the prepuce. Fissuring is very characteristic for candidial balanitis. It is not seen in balanitis due to other causes. And candidial balanitis, once we come to a diagnosis of candid uh, candidial balanitis, we need to do uh, the blood sugar levels of the patients because this is a marker of diabetes mellitus. Candidial paronychia or chronic paronychia. Now here the patient has pain, swelling and tenderness of the proximal nail folds of the fingers. This is commonly seen in people who indulge in wet work. Now what happens is uh, constant immersion of the hands in water will generally cause loss of cuticle which is a thin skin which uh, adheres the proximal nail fold to the nail plate. Now once this cuticle is lost, there is a pocket formation through which certain irritants and infections can penetrate and enter the nail matrix and cause recurrent inflammation. As I mentioned earlier, the closest differential for candidial paronychia or chronic paronychia is acute bacterial paronychia. However, in bacterial or acute paronychia, cuticle is generally not lost. Coming to the investigations, a KH mount will demonstrate the yeast. Gram stain can also be done because candida are weakly gram positive. We can also do a culture on Saburaj agar. Now, what are the treatment options available? Well, the imidazole derivatives can be used topically, that is clotrimazole, meconazole. Now, depending upon the indication, whether it is candidal intertrigo or it is oral candidiasis, we have different formulations like the mouth paint, creams, or vaginal pessary. Now, in case the patient has severe candidiasis, then systemic agents like fluconazole, ketoconazole and itraconazole can be given. Again, the point to be remembered in candidiasis is that grisofulvin is not effective even in candidiasis. So, it, it, it should not be used. Coming to ringworm infections or dermatophytosis. The word dermatophytosis means love for keratin. So these are the organisms which survive on keratin and therefore they are found on the superficial layers of the skin. This is the commonest superficial fungal infection and it is caused by the organisms called as dermatophytes. Now the dermatophytes can infect the skin, the hair and the nails. Now depending upon uh, from where we isolate these dermatophytes, it can be anthropophilic that is human to human contact, zoophilic that is from animals to humans and geophilic that is from soil to humans. Now, there are three genera of dermatophytes that is trichophyton which usually infects the skin, the nails and the hair. Epidermophyton, you should remember that epidermophyton does not infect the hair. It commonly causes tinea cruris or microsporum. It infects mainly the hair and sometimes the skin but it does not infect the nails. Now, what are the factors that predispose to dermatophytic infections? Well, tinea cruris is very common in males as compared to the females, whereas tinea capitis is a disease of the children. Why? Because at puberty, as I mentioned earlier, that the oil glands or the sebaceous glands become active and start producing sebum. Now, sebum has antifungal properties and that's the reason the adult scalp is protected from dermatophyte infections. Onychomycosis or tinea unguum is basically a disease of the old age. Then obesity and excessive perspiration can cause tinea corporis and cruris. Again, occlusive clothing, occlusive footwear can promote a dermatophyte infection like hot humid climate, also diabetes and immunosuppression. Now coming to the variants of dermatophytosis. Now depending upon which part of the body is involved, we have tinea corporis. Tinea corporis is dermatophyte infection of the glabrous skin. However, excluding the fasciae, the face that is the scalp, the palms and soles and the nails. Tinea cruris 
is dermatophyte infections of the crural areas of the body. In the groins, it is also called as dhobi itch or the jockey itch. Tinea fasciae, as the uh, uh, word mentions, is tinea of the face. Tinea capitis in the scalp. Tinea barbe is seen in the beard areas of adult males. Tinea manuum is for palms. Manicure is like for palms. So, tinea manuum is palms. Tinea pedis is for soles, that is pedicure, p pedis. Athlete's foot, it is also called as, and tinea angua, that is fungal infection of the nails. Now, what are the features of dermatophytosis? Well, tinea corporis and cruris, the classical lesions are itchy, annular or ring-shaped lesions. The word tinea itself means a ring-like uh, lesion. So, ring-shaped lesions with erythematous, scaly, papillovesicular lesions and pustules at the periphery and relative clearing in the center. So, in tinea, what we have is an active border at the periphery with central clearing because I mentioned earlier that dermatophytes basically survive on keratin. So, as uh, the center is deprived of keratin, the infection starts spreading peripherally with relative clearing in the center. Now, since crural areas, patients sweat more, so scaling is less prominent in tinea cruris. One should remember that tinea pedis is usually bilateral and tinea manuum is usually unilateral involving the dominant hand. This is also called as the one hand two feet syndrome. Now, both tinea pedis as well as tinea manuum can be associated with tinea unguum. And dermatophyte infection of the nails could be one of the reasons that the patient could be getting a recurrent dermatophytosis. Trichophyton rubrum, trichophyton mentagrophytes and epidermophyton floccosum are the causative agents. Nail involvement is usually asymmetrical in tinea unguum. Now, this being an infection, not all the nails will be involved. It is only through auto-inoculation that few nails will be involved. Now, why am I mentioning it here? We need to differentiate this from psoriasis of the nails and lichen planus of the nails. Because in psoriasis and lichen planus, there is symmetrical involvement of all the nails. In tinea, the nails become thick, fragile, discolored with subungual debris, which is called as subungual hyperkeratosis. Coming to tinea capitis, the commonest causative agents for tinea capitis are M. odini, T. tonsurans and M. canis. Now, tinea capitis can be non-inflammatory or inflammatory. The non-inflammatory one usually results in non-scarring alopecia and the inflammatory tinea capitis results in scarring alopecia. Now, in the non-inflammatory variant, we have something called as a grey patch variant where the patient presents with itchy, scaly patch of partial alopecia with lustreless hair. Whereas in black dot, the hair generally breaks at the surface of the scalp giving rise to multiple black dots on the surface and that's the reason it is called as black dot. In the inflammatory ones, we again have two variants that is carrion which is a commoner variant. The patient usually has a tender boggy swelling which is studded with pustules and favors. In favors, the characteristic feature of favors is scutula which is nothing but a cup shaped crust and favors in India is very commonly seen in the Kashmiris. Now, in both the non-inflammatory and the inflammatory uh, variants of tinea capitis, pull test is positive. That means when we uh, try to pull the hair at the periphery of the lesion, the hair can be easily plucked out. Now, why have I mentioned pull test? Because we need to differentiate the inflammatory variants of tinea from bacterial folliculitis, where the pull test is generally negative. And on doing a wood stamp examination, we see apple green fluorescence. How do we manage uh, dermatophytosis? Well, most of the times the diagnosis is usually clinical, but sometimes we need to do investigations, especially in cases of uh, uh, steroid induced tinea, which is also called as tinea incognito. So, we, need, we can take scales either from the active borders or we can take a hair clipping in cases of tinea capitis or nail debris in cases of tinea unguum and do a KOH mount and look for fungal hyphae and spores and we can even culture uh, these um, uh, scales on saburax agar. 
coming to the treatment. Now, if the patient has a very localized dermatophyte infection, then what we can use is only topical agents like clotrimazole, myconazole, ketoconazole, and the newer agents like terbinafine, sertaconazole, or oxyconazole. However, if the patient has more extensive lesions, also all cases of tinea capitis, tinea manuum, tinea pedis, and tinea unguum, we need to add systemic agents to the topical agents. Also, patients with localized tinea, uh, cap, uh, tinea who are not responding to the topical agents, we can add on the systemic agents, which include terbinafine, itraconazole, fluconazole, ketoconazole, and griseofalvin. So, griseofalvin can be used in the treatment of dermatophyte infections. Now, after finishing with the superficial fungal infections, let's come to the viral infections. So, coming to molluscum contagiosum, as the word contagiosum, now this spreads through auto-inoculation. Now, this is a viral infection which is caused by a pox virus called as molluscum contagiosum virus. It occurs mainly on the exposed areas of the body and especially in children. It spreads through close body contact. So, if children in school, they can uh, spread the infection to each other. And in adults, uh, sexual route is also one of the modes of transmission of molluscum contagiosum. Now, numerous extragenital molluscum contagiosum in an adult is a marker of HIV. Now, what is the presentation? Uh, the molluscum contagiosum lesions are smooth, shiny, pearly white dome-shaped papules with central umbilication. Now, umbilication is a feature of viral infections. And on squeezing the molluscum lesion, there's expression of a yellowish cheesy material. It is this cheesy material which contains the virus and through auto-inoculation, it can spread the infection. Pseudokibnerization may be present. Now, pseudo, why pseudokibnerization? Because, as I mentioned, now due to inoculation of the viral particles, at the sites of trauma, the patients can develop lesions at these particular sites where they scratch. Now, Jimsa stain demonstrate molluscum bodies. Coming to the treatment of molluscum contagiosum, the lesions can be extracted using curettage or we can even do an electrocautery. In children, we can use TCA application or even 10% KOH application. This is called as chemical cauterization. Coming to the next viral infection that is veruque or the common term used is the warts. Now this is caused by human papilloma virus. Now again this is transmitted by direct contact or fomites or genital warts are generally transmitted as sexually transmitted infections. Coming to veruca vulgaris. The word vulgaris in dermatology means the common variant. So we have veruca vulgaris, we have acne vulgaris, we have psoriasis vulgaris and so on. So coming to veruca vulgaris or the common warts, they present as asymptomatic, grayish, dry, cystite papules with a rough keratotic surface. Now this rough keratotic surface is what we describe as the warty surface or the veruca surface. They are generally present on the exposed areas of the body. Like molluscum contagiosum, pseudokibnerization is also seen in warts. Coming to the variants of warts, we can have filiform warts where they look like filament-like structures or digitate warts where there is a common base with multiple digits. Subungual warts is uh, the warts which are seen below the nail plate or periungual warts which are seen around the nails. Periungual warts can be painful. And veruca plana, the veruca plana, the lesions are slightly raised above the surface and they have a flat and smooth surface instead of rough keratotic classical warty surface. Coming to the palmoplantar warts. Now how are palmoplantar warts different from the common warts? Well, the common warts generally the skin is thin and therefore they generally have an exophytic growth whereas on the palms and soles the skin is thick so this prevents an exophytic growth. As a result, the warts start growing underneath the skin rather than projecting out. Now, these warts are indurated with a rough surface. Now, when we apply lateral pressure on a palmoplantar wart, it pains on pressure. Now, if we do a pairing with a sterile blade, it reveals multiple black dots on its surface which are nothing but thrombosed blood vessels. Now, what are the differential diagnoses for palmoplantar warts? Now, they need to be differentiated from a very common condition called as a corn. Now, as I mentioned, palmoplantar warts 
pain on lateral pressure whereas cons are triangular structure and at the tip of the triangle there is a nerve so when we apply vertical pressure cons pain on vertical pressure the second differential is a callosity or just simple thickness of the skin over the palms and soles at the pressure sites now in callo in callosity the dermatoglyphic lines are maintained however they are lost in warts coming to condyloma acuminata or the genital warts or the venereal warts the commonest agent causing this is the human papilloma virus 6 or it could also be caused by human papilloma virus 11 now hpv 6 and 11 are called as low risk viruses why because the patient carries a low risk of malignancy whereas hpv 16 18 31 and 33 carry a high risk for malignancy and therefore they are called as high risk warts um, uh, now condyloma acuminata begin as pink conical papules they later become fleshy pedunculated with a cauliflower like growth they need to be differentiated from the secondary lesions of syphilis that is condylomata lata which are sessile pain and smooth surface what are the sites for condylomata acuminata well it is in the males the glands the prepuce the shaft the urethral meatus and the anus and in females it includes the labia minora the vagina and the cervix now giant condyloma acuminata is also called as buschke lowenstein tumor carries a very high risk of malignancy coming to the treatment of warts now veruca vulgaris can be removed by electrocautery palm plantar warts electrocautery is relatively contraindicated so what we can do is repeated pairing with application of keratolytic agents that include salicylic acid lactic acid under occlusion or we can also go for cryotherapy whereas for genital warts topical podophyllin 20% can be applied on the lesions say at weekly or 10 days interval however this is contraindicated in pregnancy imiquimod which is an immunomodulator can also be applied on the genital warts alternate nights now for pregnant females the options available are cryotherapy or chemical cautery with tca application coming to varicella or chickenpox it is primary infection with varicella zoster virus it is transmitted as a droplet infection commonly in children the usual incubation period is 10 to 14 days the period of infectivity ranges from the prodromal phase until the formation of crust the patients usually present with constitutional symptoms like fever body ache followed by development of a pleomorphic rash on the trunk which includes macules papules or vesicles on an erythematous base now this is called as dew drops on rose petal sign they will also have pustules and crusted erosions zang smear generally shows multinucleated giant cells now chicken pox can have complications like secondary bacterial infections pneumonitis or encephalitis coming to the treatment now chicken pox is a self limiting disease it heals within 7 to 10 days systemic antiviral agents can hasten the recovery and they reduce the period of infectivity so we can use acyclovir coming to herpes zoster or shingles it is basically reactivation of the varicella zoster virus which lies dormant in the dorsal nerve root ganglion now what are the precipitating factors stress immunosuppression or old age can reactivate the virus and cause herpes zoster herpes zoster in young adults is a marker of hiv the patients generally present with pain and paresthesia which usually precedes the skin lesions the skin lesions are seen as grouped hemorrhagic vesicles on an erythematous base which are arranged in a classical dermatomal pattern along the course of the affected nerve the commonest nerve that is involved is the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve again zang smear will show multinucleated giant cells herpes zoster could have complications such as secondary bacterial infections the lesions could be gangrenous and necrotic post herpetic neuralgia is very common in the elderly patients or in the seropositive hiv positive patients they can also develop visceral dissemination 
Treatment of herpes zoster includes antiviral agents like acyclovir, valacyclovir, famcyclovir. This will not only hasten the recovery, but will also decrease the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia. Coming to HSV-1 and HSV-2 infections. Now, these are herpes group of viruses and therefore the characteristic of these viruses is that once a patient has developed an infection, they cannot get rid of this virus. Therefore, recurrence is a rule in all herpes group of viruses. The lesions are multiple grouped vesicles on an erythematous base and these lesions may be preceded by paresthesia. Zank smear shows multinucleated giant cells. The variants include herpes labialis when the lesions are around the lips. This is also called as fever blister because every time the patient develops fever, they may develop a rash of herpes labialis. Herpes gingivus stomatitis is primary infection with herpes simplex virus infection seen in children. Then they could also have herpes keratoconjunctivitis, Whitlow or gladiatorum which is seen in rugby players and boxers or eczema herpeticum. I will be discussing this later. Coming to herpes genitalis is the commonest sexually transmitted infection. Now type 2 HSV 90% of the times causes ST herpes genitalis. The incubation period is 5 to 7 days. The primary attack you should remember is severe as compared to the recurrent ones. The lesions are again in the form of grouped vesicles on an erythematous base which rupture to form painful erosions. What are the sites? Well, in males it is the glands, the prepuce and the shaft and in the females it is labia minora and labia majora. We can do a zank smear or serological test like IgG and IgM for the diagnosis. Treatment is self-limiting. We can give systemic antiviral agents. Also prophylactic antiviral therapy is recommended in case the patient has multiple recurrences. Thank you.